Hey everybody, it is a Crafty Sue again with your So What Seamstress. Um, we are still finishing up on the heavy drapes. Yeah, 17 feet, 17.66 feet, a lot of fabric. And um, where I left off last time was I showed you the side hems and the fact that you need to do a, an upper casing or a rod pocket. And then of course the hem. Now, when you're doing drapes, what you want to make sure is picture the mode of what side to what side that you're going to and it just makes for a faster project so when I do my drapes some people will, will do the hem and then they'll try to do the casing but the right way to do it to make sure that your ends are properly positioned and look professional um, so people can't tell that you made them. That's the whole point, right? Um, you want to do your side hems first. Why? Because your side hem is part of your top rod pocket. And your top rod pocket it folds over. So we're going to, the one that, that I was working on, I'm going to show you. This. I put this new setup because I was trying to think I have to switch from the cream color to the blue, and that's why the two machines. Now I know you beginners probably won't won't be doing any kind of project like this, but it just makes it easier. It's easier to have two machines set up with each color than to have one machine have to keep changing the thread. That's the way I look at it anyway. I hate changing thread, but I've said that before. Anyhow, <laughs> so. We saw that this was extremely heavyweight fabric. Now, I was using a size 16 needle. I ended up switching to an 18 for this. Now, 18 is normally for leather, but the density of the weave of this and the fact that it has these loose threads on the back and it definitely is going to need to be lined at some point. Yeah, bad mane today. Can you tell? Bad hair. Um, I keep looking at it. Like, um, so. I switched to the 18 needle for the heavy fabric. Now, in my case, I also have a lighter weight fabric. Still a heavy fabric, but not like this. That is, doesn't need an 18 needle. So to compensate for that, what you can do, and what I did, and it actually turned out very well, is I changed the tension and the stitch. I made the tension a little bit tighter, just for when I got to the blue, and then I made the stitch length a little shorter, just a, just a hair, literally just literally just a hair, and that way the stitches on the blue are consistent with the stitches on the cream. But because I'm using a, a, a cream colored thread, it blends right in. So predominantly, the predominant color on a print is what you want to use because that's what you're going to see most of. And I did get in contact with the customer, and she said she wants the fringe on top, so that's going to be the easy part. Um, and I kind of have a feeling she would, <laughs> because the fringe side, where it's attached, the tassels are attached, it's very decorative. It's very decorative. Um, I went through several presser feet. Um, for thick fabric, you can use a wide quilting foot. And I showed you one of those. I don't know if I still have it out here. But, um, yeah, I do. It's a clear foot, clear wide zigzag foot. It's basically called a wide zigzag foot. It's used for quilting, but it's also great when you have a thick fabric like this because it's as if you're quilting anyway because you're doing layers of fabric whether there's padding in there or not. It makes no difference, just thickness. Then I tried a another uh, quilting foot that was wider than that, and it had the little grid lines on for when you're doing quilting. And uh, after about five or six inches, it's like, no, it's too wide. And you'll find that sometimes will, will be the case. It sometimes will be too narrow. Um, the one thing you do want to make sure is you get the right presser feet for your machine. Not all universal presser feet fit. They'll tell you they do, but they don't. Um, <coughs> excuse me. The, the uh, Kenmore's and Singer's, typically the universal feet, do work for. But then you have Ricard. I get from Singer's. I have one in the hallway. Uh, um, then you have Janome. Then you have G well, I don't know. Yeah, Janome, Brother, Singer, White. And white is a lot like Kenmore. Um, 
So sometimes you can luck out with that. If you can compare them somehow, wherever you're purchasing them, whether it be online or you're going to an actual sewing machine shop or, or a Joanne Fabrics, um, take one of your feet that you do use with you and then you can compare the height of the presser foot part. So you're going to measure that to make sure you're getting the right shank length. This is short and then there's the long and then there's the super long. This pin more here, there's a 19, I think it's 68 or something like that, 72 maybe, but um, it has a super high shank. That's the only one I have like this, and so I baby her. I baby Lady Kimmore, because uh, if anything goes with her, I'm just going to be, I'm going to be devastated. Because <laughs> she's a wonderful machine. It's the uh, 17892, I know there's a 1789, uh, 1789, there's another, there's three more numbers, but this one is 17892, and there's another one that has a different number, I think it's five or four, whatever. But anyway, um, the foot that finally worked, finally worked was a walking foot. Now, believe it or not, this is one of those generic walking feet that was made in China. You know, not too expensive. Had to wait a long time for the darn thing. But not very expensive. But it works. It, it seems a little rickety at times, but it's, it works great. Now there's also um, this is from a, for a vintage singer, but a modern singer, I believe. I'm going to test it out and see. But this is the modern singer foot, which is a walking foot. Now that if you, um, when you're picking out a walking foot, that's another thing. Still take one of your old uh, feet, presser feet with you, because that's going to tell you where this um, part that hooks to your presser rod. If it's real low in the in the in the uh, walking foot, then it's going to work on your machine. But if you have a single with a little higher foot, it won't work because it won't be able to come down all the way. This one actually would work on this machine except for one thing. This little, oh, it might work on here. I could try it. I think I worked on it one day. <laughs> See? But this little arm on the walking foot, there's different kinds. This generic one, it just has the little bar. It just has a little bar. And it sits on top of this part of where you're... Where you turn the screw that puts your needle in, when you tighten the needle up, that bar has to go on there before you start to stitch anything. And it actually goes on there before you connect it with the, the screw knob here. So what you have to do is you have to put the foot all the way, or the bar, presser bar, all the way down. After you've taken the other foot off, you know, your regular sewing foot, take it off, put it all the way down, slide the walking foot up to it. You're not going to be able to put it into the, the screw hole because it's going to be too far down. And you put that little bar above the needle, rest, and it rests literally right on that needle um, yeah, uh, attachment. It rests right on top of it. Now, in the case of the Singer one, and I really like the way these are designed for one reason. They, they hook into that bar. They're specifically made to hook into there, and that way it's more consistent movement. The others, I think they shake a little bit. This one, like I said, this one is working fine for what I need it for, but this would be a better kind of foot to get. The one that has the, I call it the crab claw. <laughs> well, it looks like a crab claw, doesn't it? Like a crab claw. That's a crab claw. It's a claw. <laughs> it's from a movie, sorry. Um, <laughs> but, so when you put this on this kind of machine, it doesn't do this. You've got to wiggle it on. This one just literally slides on. These are much easier to put on. And I have to look and see. I don't know if Kenmore makes one like this design or not. I'd, I'd have to see. I only have the, the three walking feet. Um, one of them is for the car. And it's completely different. I mean, it's pretty wild. But its bar is really cool. If you have one of these sewing machines, <laughs> I have one that I've been trying to return to a lady that she let me borrow it for a project, and I can't get a hold of her, and I feel bad because I'm like trying to give her back her machine and it's still sitting in my closet. But this is the Ricard foot, and it, I, what I like about it is spring loaded. This is this is pretty cool, but it has to be for the machine, and for it instead of having the piece that that wraps around the uh, presser bar, 
it just has a cutout. Let me just put that there. This little guy on the side, the spring-loaded dude, he's the one that holds it in place, and he's also the one that makes the feet move. <laughs> it's pretty nifty. I keep wanting to see if it'll work on my mowing. I'm gonna have to try it later. Anyway, so that's enough of that. Um, and then of course we have this one that I use, the hem and lock. It's, it's pretty much the same thing. Um, it's a walking foot, but it also trims the fabric as you cut it. Almost like a mini circuit. Almost. Pretty close. So if you can if you can get a hem and lock that fits the machine, and these are typically oh these are made like the same as these are so cool. No wonder I like this one. It stays put. The only difference is where it goes around the uh, presser bar. It's still the little curve U thing, but it has it has the grab claw. <laughs> and then once you put it on and you um, screw on the the, uh, the screw for the side of the uh, presser bar. Then, then you can lift the foot up and down um, just like you would as you use it. Now, we've done our sides. We know how much, except I'm breaking my desk back here. Yeah, okay. I have a drawer back here and it just came off. That's okay. I'm going to take it off because it's not going to stay. And I'll fix it later. Oh, I found the thing magic. Or the jam magic, or whatever you want to call it. Um, and it's this little guy right here. I tried to use it for this curtain. I really did where the thick curtain, thick fabric on the drape meets the thin fabric. It's a very, very thick spot. As a matter of fact, I'm not going to tear up any of my sewing machine for that one spot. For that one spot, I will hand tack that down. Do not, do not try to make your machine do anything you can obviously tell it doesn't want to do. Don't hurt it. Because when you force your machine to do something it can't do by itself like that, you will damage something. It could be something minor, it could be something major, but you don't want to take the chance. You don't want to pay a repair bill. That's why I don't do it. When I see my machine screaming, it hurts, it hurts, I don't want to do it, I stop. I didn't want to go say that. I did. I kind of talked to it. But anyway, it's called a genomajig. I said the moon one. Some people call them thingamajigs, but it's a genomajig. It's a thick piece of plastic, and the way you use this is on those seams that you're coming upon that you know are too thick for your needle to go through naturally, but still not too thick that this can't help. What this does is, and where you put it, is you put it on the top of the fabric before the hump near the thick spot under your needle with like this. With the U, like if you're looking at a U, the U is like that, you know, right side up. So you put that with the needle here at the end. Did I do that right? No, I did it backwards. I'm sorry. Yeah, it has to be this way. So this is right as a U. And you put it in the fabric this way because your needle is pulling the fabric away from you. So you want it to go out. So you put it on top of the material just before the hump. Um, on it. So when you have it in here, I'm going to try to tip this so you can at least see some. Um, the needle is here at the base of the U and the opened end is all the way towards me. So when this pulls, this is going to move a little bit. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. It's going to move with the fabric. It's going to go, it's going to just lift the needle enough that it doesn't stress as it's going back down to put the stitches in that thick spot. But the thick spot in this stuff, it doesn't work for it. I tried it, and I was kind of upset, but I was like, you know what? What's a couple tack stitches? <laughs> Nothing, right? So, um, once you've done your sides, and the next thing is, I do it in this order. I don't know why. I just do it. It just, seems, just makes sense. Then I do my top rod pocket. When you're doing your rod pocket, you need to know the diameter of the rod that this is going to go over. Very, very important. Also, if you are making these for someone, like I am, and you see when you go to their home and when you do things for other people, you go to their house, and some are very nice, and uh, you go in and you look at what they already have hanging. Make note of it. If the curtain rods that they're currently using have a finial, now, finials 
is you have a curtain rod, and then you have a fancy little thing on the end. That's called a pinion. I have some that I haven't hung up in here. I can't wait. They have a big maple leaf on the end. But typically, and almost always, unless some manufacturer doesn't do this, I don't know who would do this, but one end of that curtain rod will screw off. And it's like the curtain rod people knew. Oh, they're going to put curtains around. They won't be able to put, put curtains over those big pointy round things. So, <laughs> um, you uh, would ask if you don't know, or if you buy them yourself, make sure before you get to this stage of making your rod pilot that you know how big the diameter of that rod is and whether or not you can screw the end off. The, this one, she has a three and a quarter to three and three quarter inch fancy end on her rod but the rod itself is only an inch in diameter when you're doing it via phone sometimes and when she gave me measurements I thought three and a half inches if you take a piece of ribbon if this was three and a half inches around and you took a piece of ribbon and you measured around it where it stopped take it put up next to the ruler it is 14 inches to cover a three and a half inch rod of rod that's like this chunky big or if the ends didn't come off and you had to go over something that big you would have to make a pocket 14 and a half inches around and that doesn't give you any room at the top for the little gathered part which is what I'm going to do with these so I fortunately had this old curtain rod uh, I, I use it for displaying drapes as I make them and uh there's a missing an end. Somebody knocked it off. I don't know where it is. And I think I know who knocked it off. Well, he's in trouble, by the way. Yeah, you know who you are. Um, so, if you can have the rod there, you don't always have it there if you're making them for someone else. If you have something comparable, sometimes it could be just a, a makeup tube or something. I have these little makeup bottles and they're about this big. So, when you I'll tell you the four and a half inches for the top rod pocket for one inch works fine. I knew that ahead of time. But if you don't know it ahead of time, and you know how much that you want to have to show at the top, that would be the little ruffle look, the little cute look. Well, what you're what you want to do is hold it down to where you think it should go, and then take your take the rod, literally take the rod in there and put it inside. And you, well, I did this backwards. You want to take a pin first, where you folded it down, that you're making the rod pocket, where you fold it down, place, this is why I use the long pins too, by the way. They make this easier. Um, so you pin it. I hope you guys can see it. I'm sorry, this setup is like, so kind of distant, but um, you can see it's one inch from the top. And I fold it down by four and a half, tucked under the half inch, or actually I think it's about a quarter inch. And now I'm going to put the one inch rod in there to make sure that when I hem it at the bottom here, that I still have room that's going to go on and off easily and that sort of thing. So if it goes in here, see it still has some give, that's perfect. You want it to have a little bit of wiggle room. We'll call it wiggle room, okay? We were, no word. So, for these curtains, that's perfect. I turned it down the, the disc that I wanted, and it's great. Um, the, since these were supposed to be 212 inches, and I cut them at 220, that's 8 inches, so four and a half. So, I'm going to have about a 3 inch hem on these. Now, before I do the hem, and that's why you do the hem last, this is your first panel and it is your pattern panel. When this one is done, the ones that are cut and ready to be hemmed on the sides and what and etc. You're going to lay this on top of, the, of one of them and you're going to mark it to be the exact same as this one. So when you lay this down, you're going to lay it down and on the top part you would measure down four and a half inches. This is going to be at the four and a half inch mark. So that, that four and a half inch mark, that's where you're folding it down. Does that make sense? Okay, so we're going to do this, uh, this one, 
I had done, I actually did all the way across this side. And if you do have to put tassel on the front, remember which side the tassel's going on. So you don't accidentally put on the wrong half. But since I'm doing right and left, I'm good. This will be the right one instead of the left one like I started out. I didn't know I was putting it <laughs> until I got it done. So I did the side seams. And now I'm getting ready to do the top. And on the other side, I've got it pinned where it goes. Now, why would I not just sew the fringe over this edge? She wants it on top. Where's the fringe? Come here, fringe. Come here. She wants her fringe, and this is what we're going to do. It's slippery. Let me get it. I don't want it to my face. There we go. Okay. She wants it with this side showing. Okay. Okay, so I can just go ahead, right? I can just put it right in here and just just go ahead and sew it right through, right? No. No, 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 no. Uh -uh. <laughs> no, no. But because, <laughs> mainly because she wants it on the outside. But that's not just the only reason. If I were to do that, I'm going to go through every single layer on here, aren't I? What's that going to do? It's going to close up the rod pocket. I'm not going to have a rod pocket, am I? Nope, won't have one. So, that's why before I do the top hem, because I did it like almost all the way, the saving time, you would put this piece out, so you can see what I'm doing. I left this part open, so I can put this on here, sew it, and then do the rod pocket. That way, that'll be, it'll be done. So on this, now I can be a little on the meticulous, kind of ridiculous side, but I like it to look like, how'd she put that together, kind of thing. You know, it, it's a lot of fun when you come up with ideas for someone looks at it and you're like, how'd you do that? Oh, I'm going to bring my secret. I'm going to bring my secret. So I can do one of two things on this. Now, since I'm being very careful about inches, with her project. And there is a right side and a wrong side on the fringe, by the way. The wrong side is going to be flat and there's going to be stitches on top. You can actually see the stitches on top there. Now on the right side, it's all pretty shiny and it just looks like woven. That's the top side. The right side. So for sake of yardage, since we had so much trouble with this particular project in the beginning as far as how much she did and how much she actually got, we're going to put just just a little over there over on the top, and that that'll, that'll be fine as long as it, you know it's just going to hang like this anyway. So they're not going to see that anyway. So you take about uh, about a half inch on the top, and and carefully. This material is so stiff. Uh, it's a good thing and a bad thing sometimes. So I like to kind of press down by hand. Find my crease on the top, and this is going to come around that crease just a half inch, and that's where I'm going to start stitching it. Yeah. Well, this lefty, this real life one thing. <laughs> I got to do it upside down. Well, I sure do. That's okay. I'm just going to go ahead and measure it out, pin it all the way down. This one doesn't have a hem on the other side, does it? I sure didn't. Oh, this will be fun. I get to do two things at once. I didn't do the side hem all the way down. I just did the blue side hem. Silly me. That's okay. So this goes this way. Ah! I got as much fringe as I get fabric, right? Well, you have to. So we're going to. You know what? I'm going to start at the bottom and come up to the top. It's actually going to be easier. And you figure these things out as you go. See, I told you I'm not edited. This is, this is almost like I actually is. But it is what it is. So I'm going to digress. So all the way to the back side. The bottom, the bottom part. 17 feet later. No, 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 we're over where you bet. I don't know why I keep myself into this. Is. <laughs> Holy moly. There we go. Okay. 
We're going to go like this. Now, that's the fun. If I do a three and a half inch hem on these particular drapes, um, it might be maybe an inch shorter than the 212 inches. But she told me the 212 inches to the floor. So if it's just above the floor, she said it's okay. So we're, we have some leeway. We have a loophole, okay? So, um, no, I was doing it right. I thought I was doing it wrong. Because this is, yeah. Welcome to Fabric to the Left. I'm going to go again. You probably think I'm crazy, don't you? Well, sometimes I am. Sometimes I don't know why I get myself to be a thing. I hope you don't mind me sharing this stuff, please. I'll, I'll go do that. Okay, I was first time. Don't ever second guess yourself. It's like, I do it all the time. I always want to hit myself. But anyway. <coughs> Got to try in here. Okay. Now I'm going to back to this. Right side up. Turn <laughs> down. Half, half to three quarters of an inch. Um, and then, let's see. Right side. So it's wrong side to right side when you're applying a fringe trim on the outside. Um, most times it's on the inside. And that's a little bit easier for most folks. Yeah, I'm not. Maybe not. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. I just like, it's been a long day. So I can do like this. Oh, I'm just. Mm -mm. The other way, um, because I've got to turn it under. See, since I didn't do the side hem because I wanted to show you while doing this, now this is something you actually can do. Kill, kill, oh, oh. kill like two birds with one stone kind of thing. If you can remember how to do it right. <laughs> um, there's the bottom. It's only another problem with this. You can never turn the bottom. Yeah. Okay. Because I'm going to turn the bottom up anyway, right? So I need my little ruler. For your hem, three and a half inches, like I said, for this project, it doesn't matter if it's going to be like half an inch or whatever short, because actually that would be better because you don't really want your drapes hanging to the floor to get dirty, and if you have a dog or cat, they're going to rub up against it, and ugh, so, and uh, because this material has so much fiber that flies through the air when you cut it, remember I couldn't find my pinking shears last time? I found them. These are pinking shears. Everyone needs to have a good pair of pinking shears. I've had some cheapy ones, but I don't even remember where I bought these. But these are the best pinking shears I've ever had, and they don't even have a brand name on them. So it's, it must have been an internet thing. They look good, and I bought them. But anyway, pinking shears for fabric that will fray. Okay, same deal. On the bottom. <laughs> okay. Now this one's going to be a little different because I have to turn the hem up. I don't want the fringe to go around to the, the back, except for at the very bottom, and just that half inch, like I was saying. So I'm going to turn up. After I turn in, <laughs> after I turn it in, um, I'm sorry, I'm doing this. That's kind of funny. The selvage, remember what I told you? The selvage is not take away from your width, so you that that's an extra. It's like a bonus. So you turn under the selvage. I'm going to turn it on again. And this is why I put an 18 needle in the machine. So to do this, I'm kind of be flipping back and forth. The smart way would be stitch a side seam, then put the trim on it. I'm like in, I don't know, some kind of weird crunch thing in my head. Not really crunch time, but I want to be able to get this last one out for you. So, and with lighter weight fabric, press it. I know you hate it. I don't like it either. You can't do it with this because it's just way too thick. And then put it there. Da, 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 and then the fringe goes right. Uh -huh. So I turn the ends again. And I have to remember if this fringe is going on this side, that it's going to be the right panel. Correct. Okay. The bottom piece 
And the reason why you tuck under just a little bit in the bottom is because you don't want a raw edge there and you're going to actually kind of seal it in there. Now, for this particular area, because it's the bottom hem and the fringe is only going to go on the top side of it, just like the very top, being careful not to close in the, um, the rod pocket end. I'm going to, and I can feel where it is. I don't need to see it because I got a stitch on the top anyway. So I'm going to put this under here and I'm going to uh, press foot, my walking foot, and I'm going to move that for one thing. Get my pedal over here where it belongs so it lets the slide away. They have these uh, things you can put under your uh, sewing machine pedals now that keeps your pedal from sliding. And so you're going to tuck that. See, I'm pat if I'd pinned it, if I'd been smart, I'd have pinned it. But I'm doing a feel, feel my way through. So I'm going to go as far as at least six inches or so because I know the hem's going to be coming out. I'm going to put my needle down. I always put my needle down before I start. And then make my way up. And this is where you're going to use the lines, the seam lines or hem lines on your uh, needle plate faithfully. Um, they are there for a reason. Use them. Um, they are to keep you stitching straight so that you have a guide. As long as the edge of your fabric lines up with them, you don't have to worry about whether your hem or seam is straight or not. That's what they're there for. And see how the, the difference between and, and what a walking foot does with something like this one. But I tried several different ones. I tried a stretch foot even, and that didn't work. Usually a stretch foot is, is like a good, you know, second. But it doesn't do that very well. And so what I'm doing is going to use this little walking foot till they walk me all the way home. Yeah. I did it. Oh my goodness. Like that. Sometimes the thicker pressure is actually good because you can feel it better. Any pressure you can't feel. Okay, now at this part, because of the tassel, I'm going to stop. I'm going to do a couple of backup stitches, locking stitches. Okay, and then I'm going to add the fringe to it. So that's what I'm going to do is grab all that scissors I have. Oh, I threw them back here. Oh my gosh. Okay. I mean, I could, you know, cut it on the, the uh, presser bar, but I like that easy. Because then you can cut it like real close, and not having to trim uh, thread as much. So, normally it's going to be all the way up, right? Then, I'm going to fold this up to my three and a half. I'm going to use my little, this is a quilting ruler. I love the clear uh, tools that they have. And, we're going to go like this. Three and a half, right there, about, almost. And when the thicker fabric, when you start to lay it out, it might kind of like squish out. And so, you have to look at the difference. There we go. Three and a half. So I've got my three and a half. And because this is the hem and not the rod pocket, I can sew through all this leather without a problem. Not going to hurt anything. So I'm going to turn over that half inch at the top. Now, when you're doing these hems, make sure they're flush, just like that, completely, so that that way you don't have one side higher than the other. This is where you definitely want to pin for that fact. This ends up being like double pin. I pin the hem, then I'm going to have to pin, sort of pin, I might not, I'm going to have to. The, the weight of the, the the hem so that it won't it won't shimmy on you and move around. Okay, and there you go. And just like that. And then I'm pinning it on the outside. This is a tricky part. And I want to show you the casing at the top. I can do that. So that gets folded under. And then 
what what I'll what I'll all I'll need to do after I put the fringe on, go up, do the rod pocket, come down, and do the hem. And this one's done. That's it. For the thing I wanted to have me get the one done. But it's just because we had all these snafus with the fabric. Those things happen sometimes. So we're gonna imagine this is all sewn all the way up, side hem, which it should be, before you turn up any rod pocket or or turn down any rod pocket or turn up any hem. And you put it just this goes right side up. And the fringe has to fall in. Yeah, in <laughs> towards the inside. So if I were to put this on here, right side up, which is this is the right side, that would be wrong. The only way that would be right <laughs> is if it was going to be actually inside it. But it's not. I've got to go to the other end of the tassel fringe. Find that end. And and I can't. I gotta look at another light. That's the right side. Okay, that's the right side I want. Um, and sometimes fringe will have little flaws in it. Um, you can always go back and just trim those little extra strings off. I think it's from when they have it wrapped around the original bolt kind of thing. So same thing as in, on the top. I'm just turning up a, a smidge on the hem at the bottom. So we can have more open room. Now the, all, the tricky thing with this too is you want to make sure you don't catch your tassel in this part at the bottom. You don't want to catch those in the stitching of it because it can make it really look there. And it, it changes the shape of the tassels and everything. So this one's got a, a little flawed one on the end. It's okay because it's on the bottom. So I'm kind of tucking it under so it doesn't look so bad. And that's the one that goes right there. And then I'm going to wrap it around there. And be done with that. Oh, pin. I make a sense. How'd that get in there? find all kinds of things in these little magnetic holes that I'd rather find them in there than find them on my in my foot. Right? Okay. So this is gonna be interesting. <laughs> so the mere fact that this is really really thick. I mean this is like almost a half inch thick. And that needle's not that long. So we're gonna cross our fingers. Now this is the case where if for some reason my machine says uh uh no way Jose mom no way it's gonna be hand tacked down. It's okay if it hangs loose for right now, and I will just take and do some hand, real tight hand whip stitches. And that's what you would do in this case. So we're gonna see how high my needle will go. If it's not gonna go high enough, I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm not gonna put this machine through, through that. Mm -hmm. I love my machines and I do not abuse them. They don't, they deserve all the love they can get. So, they work hard for their stuff. And I already know. It, <laughs> As soon as it sets, it's not going to go. So, and I knew that beforehand because it, you can see a walking foot weighs a lot lower, a lot lower. And when you're going to lift it up, it doesn't go very far. And this is a good eighth of an inch higher than that. So I'm not going to force it. I'm just going to go past it and then go back and hand stitch it. So hand stitching is quite the art <laughs> if you can know. Uh, Get a handle on it. Um, I've had the little snafu with the button foot. Remember that one? And because uh, I've never used one, and it was a good, ex you know, good experience for me. It's like, hmm, I need to learn how to use one of these. And maybe it was the machine. I don't know. Huh? But once I get that mastered, I will definitely do a button foot uh, video. So I'm having to go to spot start on the inside where it's thinner in a single layer and I'm going in there and I'm going to slowly move this over to where the needle is as close to where because I don't want to do a lot of hand stitches so I'm going to move it as close as you can oh my goodness this is really really thick and this is where I'm thinking I'm going to have to change the foot 
I need to put this. Not going to say that it's low, but it's still going to do the job. I believe this little guy is going to do it. The wide zigzag brush. That's what I call it. I haven't been able to figure out the name of it. I haven't done it in a while. Now, with using this instead of the walking foot, you just got to make sure that the machine is, is feeding it. And if it's, I mean, and I, if I loosen my tension on this any more than what it is, it's not going to stitch at all. So, another pitfall with thick uh, fabrics if you don't have an industrial machine. I don't have these little ones. That's why I have so many of the other ones. <laughs> there. And then you'll get to see the little bar on this one, that design. The uh, walking foot with the bar. Back to the little uh, whistle it on, clear, wide, zigzag foot. And this one is, is nice to have for the mere fact that it's as wide as the trim and it will hold the trim as well as it's being stitched. So it's kind of going to do the same purpose for me, I hope. Some parts are going to be thick. But after you do this, I'm going to do the rod pocket. And then basically it will be done as far as you all learn uh, how to do it. And not only that, see this little guy, he, he moves up a little higher, actually. There we go. And then I'm going to have the, see how the time is going to, it's only because of the very bottom, I literally have five layers. The side um, hem is two folded together, and you fold that up, so then you've got four, and then the trim is five. So that's why. Um, now, if I had a number 20 needle, oh, I would definitely put it in just for this part. Just for this part. But I don't have any. I thought I had some, but I don't. 20s are your industrial uh, needle. All right. So we've got that in there. We've got to make sure, because it's basically, I'm sewing blind, okay? The, you want to make sure the edge of the trim is right at the edge of the fabric of the side hem or seam. Whatever you want to call it. Now, this literally would need to be sewn twice. And that's why I need to be sewn twice. Why? For this fringe to lie down and hang the way it's supposed to. And I'll show you what I mean. As soon as I do this a little bit, I'm going to do this little bit of inches here with this. So I can show you exactly what I'm talking about. So it goes to the back side, cut that top in, that little half inch turn down, do that. I'm going to put the needle in by hand. I like I said, put an 18 in here since we did the last video. And I'm going to take it very, very carefully. I've got <clears throat> and my stitch is the widest stitch length on it, which I have, you know, you have to do that when you're working with thick materials. And just take the hem. Let me see tassel here. I get all over the place. I'm so baby, I know. So sometimes you have to do it one stitch at a time with a little bit of power until it gets going. But I'm not going to make my sewing machine do it all. Okay. That's the way you can kind of lift it up, get it to that kind of thick spot. I don't want to pull it too hard, so it just gets in there. As soon as I heard it go, ah, it's like, okay, use your hands. Get your foot off the pedal. Help, help it. This is the only nerve I for doing a heavy drape with a tassel thing. I'm kind of glad you guys got to see something that's simple but difficult at the same time. In straight lines, it's easy, it's easy, but when it makes your machine go a little, mm -hmm, it can be a little bit of a pedal keeps going away from my foot. And you'll see, as soon as you get to the thinner part, oh man, it's like, ah, oh, I feel better. <laughs> hey, she found the off spot. <laughs> I pulled it all far. Now see, I had to be real careful so the tassels wouldn't come out of there or get caught up under. They have to be on top. And 
I gotta go to this. Now, I want to just show you how these are gonna hang if I don't do the second row of stitching closer to the edge. Um, some people call it a, top, a type of top stitching. But in the ad is, but not so much. So here, and you, you can feel the very bottom stitching where, where it's touching, so. Okay, that's enough, I think, to show you. Look at me. I'm gonna finish it this, this way and get to see how it looks if you don't do double rows on a tassel uh, string. Because as the drapes are opened and shut, oh my gosh, grab my show hands. I keep forgetting there's a pin right here on the back side. I probably should do it over here. Then it's for safety's sake, <laughs> we go vertical instead of horizontal. But if you only do the one row of stitching for these, what occurs is, as they're opened and shut, you can see this, 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 you have this flat looking thing. And if you only stitch that one close to the edge, it's going to do the, it's going to do the same thing on the other side. When you have a wide um, seam look, I call it a wide seam look, on the fringe, you want to do, just like there's one, two, there's four rows of stitching here, you do two. An outside one, and an outside one, an edge and an edge. That will finish off, the, and so when these hang, that fringe is going to be hanging just like that. Just like that. It's kind of cute. So let's step to the board. And then, of course, for each one of these, I'm going to have to go back and hand tack this down. That's the other good thing with the woven um, main fabric, cutting fabric. There's so many fibers that you can get into. You don't have to. As long as you make tight little stitches, it'll stay. It won't hurt anything. Uh, then we're going to go to switch to the blue so you can see the rod pocket. And I don't know why I set these machines up the way I did. So I can kind of like roll them around for you. <laughs> I don't, I can roll the tape with a pen on it and then Oh my gosh. Now we go to the back. So we've done the side hems. We've done the bottom hems. And now we're doing the rod pocket. So the rod pocket will be relaxed. Unless you figure out what I did the other way. I mean, I've done it the other way. I can't. I can't. I don't know right now. So anyway, we took our one inch rod, pinned where we thought the seam should be, and it was right. So on this, I think I was almost to the end, and because the fringe is going to go on here, I don't want to do the fringe all the way up this one side. It's going to come up around the top. This is the back. It does not have to go all the way down. Remember, we're saving on inches on the trim. So we're going to do it there. So I'm not going to go all the way to this end. I'm going to go as far as where I stop here. And that way you can kind of see the gathered look. I want to show you how it looks. Um, the bottom portion I had sewn earlier, the um, seam lines on your uh, machine, on your needle plate, there'll be 5 8 7 8 the next one will be 8 8 which will be an inch. So, where I pin the pin, I just want, I want that much at the top for the ruffle. Not, not a huge amount, just about that much. And on here, if I go to measure it, with marks on the needle, well, excuse me, needle plate. It is, it is way more than an inch. It's like, it's like an inch and almost an inch and a half. Just about. Now there is something that I'm not using that I should, probably should use. And it, it's a seam bar or hem bar. And I don't know, I have, probably have one for this machine. I'll we'll have one put on there. I've got doing these things like eyeballing them forever, my whole life. So it's like, yeah. I use one of those. And I had oh, I had one out here yesterday. Where's my hat pants? I'm over here somewhere. The only problem with having a lot of drawers, can't find anything from here. Unless, unless it is, 
Hold it in here. I just want to see it. What? You just asked me. Oh, da, 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 da. I'm wasting time again, Sue. You want to save time? You're wasting time. All right. This is ridiculous. Because I have one. Oh, this. You know, there's got to be one in here. Yes, there is. There it is. Okay. This is a form of. Put them up there. Okay. This is a type of. Uh, Chem guide, seam guide, you can use it for both. Where you attach it to the needle bar, and then this goes to where, where you want the fabric to just touch, and it'll keep it straight for you. So I'm actually going to be a good girl and put this on. It really could use one. So like I said, I get real stubborn on it. Yes, I can. So for the project for this, this goes with it, right above the foot. And this is a um, this is one for a new home I'm making, but I'm going to cross my fingers and see if it will stick to me more. And so far, so good. And I like this little curve because you can make you know make it go down and go up, and then you you, you pull it out to the distance you need. Up to, I think it goes up to three inches. I'm pretty sure that's the max on these. I'm going to put it where I'm lying, where I've got it under the needle. I'll line it up to where it's just touching. And that that stops. And that keeps your seam line straight. Keeps you from making a crooked uh, rod, rod pocket. And, yeah. and it, it does a little, it has a little movement to it, but um, that way it allows the fabric to go through. But this is kind of exciting, right? Not use one of these anymore. I don't have one. So we're going to see how this rod pocket goes. Um, like I said, I'm not going to go all the way because I have to do the trim on that other side. This. And I lost my pedal. All this fabric, I can't find a pedal. There it is. All right. Give it up. And we're going to slip this forward and this backward. And you want to go all the way to the edge on your casing as far as making sure that the end is completely nice and tight and flush. So when you're uh, putting the rod in here, that top seam is what the rod lays against. And that's why you want to make sure of uh, your length when they're being hung. So this is going to take up about two inches off the floor. And that's going to be perfect, actually. Because um, it's not too high, not too low. One of the other things I had to do was I had to change thread for this project. The thread I started out with was not as um, sturdy as, say, a Coach and Clark um, polyester. That's what I had, I think, it was in there with a Coach and Clark polyester. And it was just not, it started where it started to break as I got into thicker spots. And so. That's when you ask at the at your fabric store in your neighborhood or whatever, just which brand makes a better uh, thread, polyester thread for a project that's for like drapes, or heavy drapes. Um, I would not. It's not always the one that says heavy duty. It's not always that thread that's going to work. Believe it or not, it's, it's not always that one. Because if you get a thread that's too way too thick, when you go to put it in here, your machine's going to go, uh-uh, let me put that through here. Because it's looking for an, like an industrial type uh, setup. That's the real thick thread that almost feels like, I don't know if you've ever felt button thread, but it's, it's like a button thread. And button thread feels like cording almost. And it's really heavy duty. 
This is a little, you can tell the quality of this red just by the way it feels. And protein part, it's your granite, but there are some weights of it that just don't work for something like this. Lots of gathers, you let the sponge it keeps light out or keep you know cold out, keep the heat in, that kind of thing. Um, keep the cold in so then what you would want to do is I'm just gonna do one or two. Um measure two and a half times the width of your window when you go to get your material. Now this little baby is just about thin. And this one is full of red. What do you think? How about that? And we have a pair of scissors there. And there we go. Did everybody submit your uh, black thing story? I don't think you did. I do have some winners though, and they're going to be happy, and I'm going to be happy because they're happy. That's the whole deal, right? Okay. Curtain rod. We have a one inch curtain rod. My pen is going to take out. <laughs> I'm going to stick myself. As the, uh, I think what we're going to do, so everybody gets to know this crazy woman sitting in front of me, um, that loves to sew, and I love to cook, and I, I love my cat, but I think I'm going to do like quizzes and contests and things, because when kids are fun, people like trivia, right? Now, I'm going to find out how many people listen to what I say. And if they can comment the answer to the question, they're going to win a prize. Hmm. What prize is it? Okay. One inch rod. We've taken the finial off to be able to put it through the rod pocket. Now, some people do a rod pocket like this, and then they go to hang it up and they decide, I don't want the rock with the back. As long as the top is wide enough to put this through it, you can make it flush with the ceiling. Some people like their curtains to look like that. And I think this one, this one would do it. That's why I kind of did it this way. You see how it's just kind of flat? Now that's how my washroom curtain is, flush to the door opening. Now, for those of you who want a gathered curtain, take the bottom and put it in the bottom. And for, just for uh, example's sake, and go like this, and we're going to say that this is as big as our window is, okay? And you're going to imagine that there's only two of these. You see how stiff this is? I believe this is outdoor waterproof fabric for, like, patio furniture. Not good material for a curtain. But for making a nice stiff ruffle with the top, it actually goes pretty well. Okay, so this is what you would do. You would, you know, kind of adjust it. Now, you see how there's going to be really, it's going to be really cute with ruffles at the top. And I, I, I hope she does get the gold and blue, actually, I'm, I'm a glutton for punishment, I think, to put at the very top, because that would be really pretty. Just to kind of show you. Just imagine this has blue in it. So you have the fringe on the inside. And the up, yeah, that the outside, and then you have this that's going to be right there against the blue. That would be sharp. Yes, she, she probably been crazy about the fact they gave her the idea because <laughs> she'd already figured on this one. So these are the heavy drapes. Um, of course, this would have been a lot easier, even if they were just heavy drapes. If it was just the one material, well, we had the two to deal with, and uh, we dealt with them. The only other thing, if you have end up doing something like this. We have two ways of fabric is make sure you have the right needles. Make sure that you have the feet that will facilitate the thicker fabric and the thinner fabric. If you have them connected and, and getting ready to go down the side like with these, and you don't want to have to change the needle, you've already got an 18 in there. All you got to do is, like I did, make the stitch a little smaller, 
and uh, tighten up the tension and then just remember to loosen the tension when you go back over the thicker fabric. The only other thing is when these two colors are attached on the back to keep this lot laying down and since it's not searched itself, what I can do is a, a uh, I think I can, let me see. Yeah, at the very edge of it, I'm going to do a, zig, a small, very small zigzag stitch to have it made, made like flat, to keep it flat. And it, it won't uh, deter on the other side because it's a woven top. Um, if it was not a woven top fabric, then I would do just a straight stitch right at the top seam and have the, the, the loose part uh, searched. I actually did that the cut and hem slip with that one. And because I, <laughs> I have to be con and consistent in color, I'm going to have a blue in the bobbin area, and then the same is going to be on the top because the blue comes down below here in the front. So you don't want to have blue on the top. I don't want blue on the top, blue on the bottom. So when I get through with this, doing this part of it, it'll look like it's just like blue there, you know, like it was just one piece. And that's the whole point, to make it look like something fabulous. Um, now, to do the next panel, like I said, just a reminder, you lie, after you're done with this one, you're going to lay it flat on top of the next panel. Since I have this seam where they were connected, that's where I'm going to start. I'm going to go from there up and then from there down, and then uh, go down the hem and the... Uh, rod pocket portion to make them the exact same way. That's how you would do a, a project like this. A in the in the respect of one color, one material. Basically, the same thing. You do one panel. You do the side seams. You do the hem. You do the top. You do the rod pocket. You lay it on top of the next one, and then you just pin where you have to turn it down to make it a finished same size. I hope this has been helpful. It's been a long <laughs> explanation for a crazy, unusual project. I've never really done one where you had two different weight fabric and two different colors. But sometimes you have to get creative when um, you run out of yardage. I've had some things like that, but not like this one. <laughs> not, not too nasty. No, I've never had that problem. But um, so. Please leave me some comments uh, if you have questions, um, if there's a project that you're contemplating and you just want some pointers, that would be great. Uh, the blessing contest is over as of midnight last night, and so if you didn't get your submission in, it's technically not too late. We have some new ones coming up to stop. I'm doing a once a month quiz. And I don't know if it's going to be one question or three, you know, but it's to see how many people are actually listening to what I'm saying and if they really love the competition. I mean, it's healthy, isn't it? I mean, that's what I really call competition healthy. And uh, I know people like winning stuff. I like free stuff. I like free stuff. I like giving away free stuff. That's what I like doing. I like giving away free stuff. And so, um, I'm not going to tell you what the prizes are until I've notified the winner. And that's probably going to be pretty soon. At least it's going to be before the 15th. I've got this crazy thing to finish up and then I can concentrate on one other thing to share with you. And uh, this is one creative project. And as I have always said, that if you sew, you got to do three things. Oh, actually three. No, oh, there's three. Find your joy first, and it becomes a passion to create. Just keep sewing.